stare at the foreign cars that drove up and down the street and laughed at the Eiffel Tower or Big Ben, which did not compare to the Soviet monumental art. But on the whole, they found abroad pretty neat. It was nothing special, but they weren't disappointed either. The food and the hotel tasted strangely foreign, and the native French or English people, who were mostly unemployed, sat in their cafes all the time, drinking vodka with beer, naturally not in huge quantities that we had back home, but in tiny little glasses. They greeted the Soviet tourists very kindly, and almost every one of these unemployed foreigners understood a few phrases of Russian. After three or four days, the Russians flew back to their family. My uncle really wasn't ever supposed to see this Paris because of his past, but back then there were no computers, and even the sharpest state apparatus makes a mistake every now and then. When Uncle Boris was honored for a second time for his excellent work in the rubber business, he was given a three-day trip to Paris. The news spread quickly, and all the neighbors came to say goodbye. Euphorically, they made up lists of presents that they wanted Uncle Boris to bring back from Paris. He himself had only one wish, which sounded very childlike, to get drunk as a lord on the Eiffel Tower. Everyone laughed about the dream. Boris took a bag of Soviet canned food with him and a Russian-French dictionary. The flight to Paris lasted six hours. The first two days, my uncle tried to get away from his group. Every time they gathered below in the hotel lobby, Uncle Boris went to the bathroom and sat there as long as he could in the hopes that the group would go into town without him. But when he came out, they'd all be standing by the bathroom, waiting patiently for him. After that, they drove together in a bus to the center to go shopping. On the third day, Uncle Boris finally lucked out. While the group was browsing in a sweater shop and the tour directors had briefly lost sight of them, a bus stopped directly in front of the store. Without pausing for long, Uncle Boris jumped on. The bus was almost empty except for a pair of crumpled Frenchmen. A bottle of vodka and a phrase book were in my uncle's pants pocket. Now he had only to find the Eiffel Tower. The bus driver looked at him in a friendly way. Salut, Rosso, Turisto, he greeted him. My uncle thought to himself, I've seen that man before. Someplace. This plump, eyebrowless face and this grin. Were you ever in Kazakhstan? My uncle asked, and then held up his Facebook. Do you have you Kazakhstan? <laughs> no, said the bus driver. Je suis de Marseille. Comprenez-moi? <laughs> I've seen you before, my uncle said again. But on the quick, he couldn't find the words. Est-ce que nous allons passer devant la tour Eiffel? Bien entendu, said the driver, and grinned again. The Frenchmen on the bus all began to smirk. Out the window, Uncle Boris caught a glimpse of the Eiffel Tower. Stop here, he called out to the bus driver. I'm getting out here. Merci pour tout et bon voyage. Take care of yourself, Grandpa, murmured the bus driver, and put on the brakes. My uncle jumped out of the bus. In front of him was a typical Parisian street. French coffee drinkers sat in two small bars. Housewives did their shopping. A grandmother pushed a stroller in front of her. Through an open window, you could hear music. Suddenly, a man struck, stuck his head out the window and called out something loud in French. The whole street got up and started quickly towards the Eiffel Tower. The first tourist buses were arriving, and a tour guide from my uncle's group was there. He ran to him, out of breath, and grabbed him by the sleeve. What shit are you pulling? Where were you trying to go? His voice was high with agitation. Nowhere, Uncle Boris responded. At once, he knew where he'd seen the bus driver. It was the guy who used to drive him to work every morning, 20 years earlier, when he was still a rubber plant director, living in a dugout. The group flew back to Kazakhstan that same day, and Uncle Boris drank his vodka not on the Eiffel Tower, but in his hotel room, along with a pair of worthy workers who he had shared the room with, and a woman with numerous offspring who had happened to drop by. It may be that I've missed out a lot in my life, that I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and that I was unjustly sentenced, but all the same, I was in Paris. And that experience I'll take with me to my grave, Uncle Boris told me proudly and laughed. At the time, his story seemed absolutely unbelievable to me. Years later, after Perestroika, as ever more unbelievable stories came out of the dark past of the country and came into the open, I had to change my opinion. I read the reports from eyewitnesses of people who had built Paris and lived there for years. 
Also, many novels and stories have been written about it, so I arrived at the conviction that my Uncle Boris had told me the truth, after all. His Paris was a chimerical city, erected as a kind of ideological condom to protect the population from the tainted charms of Western civilization. Such methods work, but they never last. The truth comes to light sooner or later. The Russian Paris lasted no longer than five years. During a trip through Russia at the end of the 70s, a clever Dutch journalist came across a pair of photos that a young dairy maid in a collective farm showed him. There she stood with her mother, a worthy dairy maid of the Soviet Union, under the Eiffel Tower and smiled at the camera. To the Dutchman, the Eiffel Tower in the photos had a strikingly socialist air. He put the young, naive woman <laughs> under pressure and in the end convinced her to accept his valuable, but on a dairy farm totally useless, di dictation machine in exchange for her photos. The Dutchman vaunted the machine as a foreign speaking machine, a true wonder of technology, and practically ripped the photos of the Eiffel Tower out of the girl's hand. One of them turned up a few months later in the feature section of a Dutch newspaper. At first, nobody in the West took the story of the picture seriously. Everyone thought the whole thing was a joke. But the then head of the KGB, Andropov, did not find the photo in the foreign newspaper funny at all. He ordered Paris Pride sorry, Project Paris to be torn down to the last stone in the shortest time possible. Many construction worker brigades from the Congress and the Interior Ministry participated in the destruction of the French capital. It had to all go down quickly, almost overnight. According to reports of eyewitnesses, the KGB needed more money for the planning of the destruction of Paris than had been needed earlier for the building of the city. Beyond that, and as a consequence of the hastiness of the demolition work, many valuable objects were lost. The whole Parisian infrastructure ended up by the roadside. Among other things, more than 500 Philips televisions, several hundred refrigerators, a few cars, and countless doors and windows. In spite of strong controls, entire houses disappeared this way. It was stolen, was the refrain. The heads of the KGB followed the thieves, but not very far. They just wanted their Paris buried to the to end the history to be forgotten as quickly as possible. Afterwards, the fall of the city had a rather positive influence on the architecture of many villages in the southern Russian steppes. Travelers still marvel at the chic glass doors and unusually wide windows in one pigsty or another. Even 10 years on, a four meter long broken Big Ben with its hour's hand snapped off still lay in the bend of the road of the city in Inazomzova. In the natives considered it one of the best sights to see in the area. They have no idea where it came from, but the giant clock has come to be called Monument to Lost Time. <laughs> Some sort of something back there, EJ? Some wine, some yeah. cheese and crackers. And then also tapas later. And if you if you need a bus ride, the red line leaves from here at 7.55. So um, see you guys all later. And be sure and check over the summer. We'll have more events coming up in the fall, and we'll notify all of you then. So thank you again, everyone.